Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dean Stephen. We're familiar with the typical symptoms of COVID-19, fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, but other symptoms can also be present in neurological problems like headaches, confusion, and seizures. Here to discuss is a Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Alan Axenet. Doctor, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about why COVID-19 is affecting patients' neurologic function? Well, uh, again, one of the issues here, I think, uh, that I've spoken about before is the challenges of understanding how much of the virus affects the nervous system directly versus indirectly. And of course, when people are sick, when their respiratory system is failing, that will have adverse effects on the brain because of poor oxygenation and other metabolic effects that are consequence on the brain. Those things we know as serious, but we also know that those are not direct effects of the virus on the brain itself. But there have been other reports that have come out among the patients who have experienced COVID-19 that they've developed some neurological signs and symptoms. And the question, of course, that arose then from that information is whether that is direct effects of the virus actually getting into the nervous system and damaging the brain, or whether it's, an in, again, an indirect effect as a consequence of the respiratory and other compromise of the rest of the body. So th that's kind of the background the, upon which um, the challenge of trying to sort that out uh, arises. We just simply don't know that yet, if, is that, if that's what we're seeing? Right. There are uh, mixed messages. The information is a bit nebulous, a little bit unclear as to whether the nervous system is directly affected by the virus or not. There are bits of information that can have come out from a number of studies of looking at clinical evaluation of patients that would suggest that there is nervous system direct involvement by the virus, but the, the uh, reliability of those studies is still in question. And there is clearly an overlap between direct involvement of the nervous system and, and these other systemic effects from respiratory compromise. Could you talk a little bit about what specific neurologic effects um, we are seeing in some COVID-19 patients? Probably the best study that was uh, the, the most it has the most information is a study that was published from a group of patients from Wuhan, China, that were 214 patients um, that were published recently in the neurological journal here in the United States that divided the neurological manifestations associated with COVID-19 into basically three categories. One was the central nervous system category. Two was the things that affected the nerves. And, I could, and I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that. And third was those affecting the muscle. And again, in each circumstance, some of those are uh, maybe nonspecific effects of the virus rather than the specific direct involvement of those nervous system tissues. We've been hearing a lot about um, some COVID-19 patients experiencing loss of taste and smell um, as a symptom. What can you tell us about that? It's a great question and a lot to be said and a lot of uncertainty. Let's, let's start there. Um, the first issue is um, it seems to be that loss of taste and smell we call it anosmia and dysgeusia, to use the, the technical words, are associated with early involvement uh, with the respiratory tract by COVID-19. It seems relatively uh, as a sensitive indicator of that disease. Now, two things to be said about that. One is, of course, that COVID-19 is not the only virus that causes those kinds of symptoms. Influenza is well known to do that. And there are other respiratory viruses that can cause similar kinds of troubles. And then the second issue, of course, is whether the virus is actually affecting the nerves directly that have to do with taste and smell. This has to do with what we say olfaction, the smell of nerves, the first cranial nerve. And the question is, is, is it the nerve itself that's involved or is it the respiratory epithelium that interacts with the nerve in the back of the, of the nose. And it seems that the studies point to that as being the principal problem rather than something due to direct involvement or damage to the nerves. There was a study that was recently done that came from, uh, the, from California. It looked at a number of patients who had respiratory 
involvement by COVID-19 and had anosmia and dysgeusia, this trouble with taste and smell. And they found that the patients, once they recovered from COVID-19, they had rapid recovery of their taste and smell as well, which would be incompatible with damage to nerves, the way nerves regenerate. It just doesn't happen very fast. But the epithelium, the lining of the back of the nose that interacts with the nerves, that can regenerate rather quickly. And so that would fit better with this idea that the respiratory epithelium that interacts with the taste and smell nerves uh, has is at the root of this problem with uh, poor taste and smell. Delirium has also been listed as a symptom. Why does that happen? Delirium is a, is a tough one because uh, it can be a consequence of lo low oxygen to the brain. So again, when we're talking about COVID-19 and its respiratory consequences, one of the major issues is, is compromising the lungs and oxygenation. And of course, if low oxygen occurs, that has adverse effects on the brain. The, and one of the manifestations of that can be delirium or even coma. It's unclear whether the delirium, therefore, is just a respiratory effect or metabolic effect, or as I've said before, that there might be some, some suggestion that this virus can, in certain circumstances, get into the nervous system. In the patients that, that I quoted uh, that study from, the, the Chinese study of 214 patients, um, they found that um, they had uh, headache and dizziness as the most common neurological manifestation. And that was in about uh, 14 and 13%, 13 respectively. Delirium and troubles with a loss of co impaired consciousness only occurred in about 7% of patients. So it's relatively infrequent. And then those patients were not studied with the kinds of things that we usually use to measure whether the virus is in the nervous system, like spinal fluid examination and trying to culture or do molecular tests on the spinal fluid. Yeah, you know, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but will these effects be long-term? Hard to say. Simple answer is we don't have enough information to clearly answer the question with certainty. At least in most of the cases where imaging has been done of the brain in association with the neurological manifestations, the imaging abnormalities have been generally regarded as unrevealing or, or often normal. So that's a good sign. That means that there is not so much irreversible damage. Now, there are exceptions to that. One of those main exceptions is, the, is association with stroke. Stroke is one of the conditions that has been seemingly at higher incidence in patients who have involvement of the body by the, by the COVID-19. And the mechanism by which stroke occurs in the brain is unclear uh, in this circumstance. It's thought that a lot of it might just be worsening of pre-existing conditions people who have diabetes, who have hypertension, who have other uh, smoking history, where they have damage to the blood vessels already and are predisposed to stroke already, and now are being stressed from a respiratory perspective by this intense illness, and therefore it precipitates a stroke as a consequence of that. So uh, that may be a more likely mechanism than that there is a specific injury to the brain blood vessels that's causing stroke. There are animal models in the old SARS virus, the one that preceded this virus in 2002 and 2003, where there was some evidence that some of the blood vessels were damaged in patients who had had that virus. And so um, it's at least plausible that some, that some of the stroke problems that have occurred currently could be theoretically related to virus involvement of the blood vessel, but that, the, the proof of that doesn't exist. There's still a lot to learn about this virus and how it will behave. Um, but if COVID-19 becomes seasonal, how can we protect ourselves against neurologic complications? Well, I think it's going to be the same things that we speak about for, treat, uh, for treating COVID-19 in general. We'll need to try to develop a vaccine would be the best way, of course. If we develop some antiviral medications that clearly have uh, substantial effects against the virus, that's going to be protective as well. And, and again, uh, doing things that are the things that we're already doing, social distancing, the other hand washing, not touching your face, doing those things, of course, are 
going to be the principal answers to that. Uh, once the virus takes hold in the body, there's not a whole lot, I think, that we can say that would prevent neurological disease from emerging associated with the infection. Again, if we're able to find some um, successful antiviral therapy that can work in the body to try to limit the infection, that would be the best approach. Dr. Axman, is there anything else that you wanted to add or touch on? Well, there's a lot of things that you may hear about that will be associated with COVID-19 that, that are not so well publicized. There have been a few patients who have had uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. You may know that condition. Uh, it's a neurological <laughs> syndrome that affects the peripheral nerves. That one uh, it has been now reported in a few patients. It seems to be not a direct infection of the nerves, but rather an immune reaction against the nerves in the few cases where that's occurred in association with COVID-19. It's similar to what occurred in the past with swine flu, you may remember. Uh, there were some cases uh, in the 1970s associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome at that time. Uh, sometimes after a vaccine, well, people will develop a Guillain-Barre syndrome. So those are things that uh, you may hear about. Um, there's been evidence, as I said before, about muscle damage that's occurred as a consequence of infection. We know that muscle damage can occur in critical illness sometimes, just because the patient is very sick, uh, bed-bound uh, on a respirator, on other supportive um, machinery, and that can cause damage to the muscles by itself how much, how severe uh, is quite variable. And so it's something else you might hear about. I think we talked about stroke already. We talked about the, 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 the smell and taste problems. And again, the principal things that we'll see from a neurological viewpoint will be uh, changes in mental awareness, cognition, troubles with uh, difficulty of interaction or, or uh, able to, ability to interact with in the environment. Again, one of our concerns is how much of this is going to be long lasting, how much of this is just a temporary effect of the metabolic disturbances. So uh, those those are very much uncertain uh, points at this time. Very good. Well, that's all great information. We've been discussing the neurological effects of COVID-19 with Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Alan Axan. Thanks so much again for joining us. Thanks again for having me. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.